Ahem, and we're back. Welcome back to the Exino Zinga Show, episode number 168. Uno says Ocho with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How's it going? How you feeling? Hope you guys are well rested, hydrated, limbered, all that sort of good stuff. Um, I'm feeling very good this morning. Got the coffee in hand, as you can see. Uh-huh. Just got back from the gym, did a little workout, some strength and conditioning today, some back squats, some heavy deadlifts, um, some overhead presses. And I feel fucking awesome. Um, I feel also quite good because um, the gym that I go to, the local leisure center around the corner from where I live, they finally got some new plates in the gym. They've updated their equipment. Previously, we had these weird plates that weren't really, they weren't a good size. You know, they weren't like the Olympic weightlifting size plates. But now they've got those plates that are just really massive, but they weigh, you know, according to what they weigh, etc. So that they look quite good aesthetically. And um, when you slip them onto the bar, you don't need you don't really need to clamp them as much as you need to clamp the other weights because they fit quite snug onto the bar, um, which helps as well. Because sometimes um, clips in the gym are hard to come around, are hard to come by because you know people end up stealing them or forget they put them in their bag or they're scattered around the gym. So or they just are not that tight as as you'd want them to hold them to the plates but so now we have these new plates in the gym and um yeah everything is going pretty well in there um for 25 pounds whatever i pay a month it's fucking quite banging there's um if i add on i think a fiver i can do some swimming which is good for me you know being a black man i need to probably learn how to swim um someday rather uh, sooner rather than later and um yeah for the most part it's pretty cool it opens i think until 10 o'clock on the weekdays eight o'clock on the weekends like a decent gym man a really decent gym um i i spent a lot of time going to crossfit boxes in the beginning right i went to a couple crossfit boxes in the start and you know they're expensive everyone knows that i think the ones the one i went to last was like 100 quid a month for three sessions a week which again isn't too bad because you're in a class and you obviously when you're in a class environment you push yourself a bit more the people around you push you um there's that little added element of competition um, there's that weird um, scoreboard thing on in CrossFit where you put your finger up on a whiteboard and it gives you a bit of extra motivation. You have coaches um, guiding you through the exercises and making sure your form is correct and you're doing the right things and you're not getting into bad habits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, I'm not the group activity kind of dude. I like doing things on my own, as you can see from the podcast. I like to kind of be on my own island and go from there. So um, the, whole, um, the whole CrossFit box thing class workout stuff wasn't the best thing for me and there's something quite annoying quite silly about someone telling you come on five more push-ups you can do it give me 10 15 more every time you hit 15 you got five like that stupid psychological thing they do right it's just annoying i just don't find it even moving it's just like what are you doing how, how many are meant to be doing if it's 20 tell me 20 if it's 30 it's 30 don't keep giving me these um imaginary goals i have to keep hitting after i hit the goal that i already hit all oh, these stretch goals sorry whatever they call this it's like it's annoying um and as well the it, it just you know there's a certain type of personality that goes to a work class a, a a group a group exercise activity thing and i just i'm just not that personality you know um i don't know coming in with all the fucking gear all the straps and the shoes and the waist and band and the fucking belts and ah uh, enough i don't care leave me alone so yeah i'm happy that is the kind of over and again i think for some people the money is a, is a big deal because 100 quid a month is a lot more than 25 but then you know the gym that I go to is a is a local council gym. It's not like um you know it's not like a Virgin Active or whatever. So I think there's an in between, isn't it? So there's like a there's like a council gym that I go to that's like twenty quid, and then there'll probably be the Virgin gyms or the better gyms that'll be about thirty to fifty, and then you'd have the upper echelons which are the hundred quid gyms, which are like the what's the private one in Soho? There's like a private one that's in Soho they can go to. It's got a spa and a shower and that sort of shit. Um, a kind of wellness center, quote unquote, not the wellness center that girls get when they get plastic surgery, but you know, wellness center where you go and work out. So um, those things. But in general, I just all I want is a is a rack with the where I can squat, where I can overhead press, uh, a platform where I can do some benches, where I can do some sort of deadlifts from, maybe a bench, do some deadlifts and some other um, workouts, and that's it. And some pull up bars. That's all I need. I and all the other stuff is a, it's just like you know it's extra for no real, no real reason, in my opinion personally. I don't even write stuff. And plus, you know, I run all the time as also all those extra added equipment are so just a waste of time. But yeah, I'm feeling good, man. I'm feeling strong. Um, diet's been in diet's been in um in a good place since I've started training a lot this past couple of weeks. Um, I've been fasting as well. 
which has helped a lot as well with them, um, you know, shedding off the pounds and all that stuff. Malaki, um, I've kind of lost about five pounds already since the last time I weighed in. So I'm about 226 now, which is good. I'm trying to aim to get to at least a 220 by the end of the month, which would be nice. And then from there, try and lose the last 20 pounds between now and the end of April, which is kind of my kind of stretch goal. So those are the goals I have at the moment. And again, it's going to mostly it's going to come down to diet anyway. The workouts are going to be, you know, things just to make me stronger and to obviously to allow me to have a better um, cardiovascular base in order for me to run and do the race I want to do. But in general, I think that gives it enough time to kind of lose the weight. And then that'll be that would have been like like let's say four months to lose 30 pounds which is a lot lot of time i can do it probably sooner and um, if i just cut out all the shit but i know you know with the djing stuff i always have weekends where i go and drink all this sort of stuff so i can't necessarily commit to that but if i wanted to commit to 30 days just losing weight i could easily lose 30 30 pounds in 30 days that, that could easily happen but i'd have to commit to like not going out at all and you know with the djing stuff i'm doing it's kind of um unrealistic Talking about DJing, I am DJing tonight actually in Dawson um, from 9 to half 12 at the Free Compasses on Dawson Lane. So if you're in the area, check that out um, for my night called Bump. I got a lot of disco, um, got some, you know, some kind of some R&B-ish kind of vibes to play as well. And then some other bangers that got stashed on the USB. And then on Saturday, I'm playing at the Heathcote and Star here in Leighton Stone. And that is, again, from 9 to 1 this time. Um, again, similar sort of vibe. And that's from my night called Labatees. Um, all details you can find on my website, xnozinga.com. Um, click on the DJ gig section and all the listings should be on there. Um, anyways, apart from that, I'm still recovering. 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 From that United game against PSG last night, or the other night, sorry. Um, I still can't get it out of my head. It's still something that I'm still shocked as to how it happened. Um, again, just in terms of a sports psychology um, aspect of it, I wonder what the PSG dressing room was like after that game because, you know, they've had a history of um, choking at the last hurdle, um, even though, you know, their, their investors have pulled in so much money into that club in order to them to win the Champions League, you know, the signings of Cavani, um, Neymar, Mbappe, don't come cheap. Um, so they're having to sign these big ma- these big players. Obviously, they've got a big manager with a huge reputation in Thomas Tunkau, who's coming, or Tunchu who's coming, who's been somebody that's been raved about for a while. And it just kind of faltered, and especially against us, United, w- where we were absolutely stripped of any kind of threats, right? Or, you know, any dangers that would really kind of put their place in the last 16 in jeopardy. Um, we had our midfield decimated, our defences shaky, and just generally, you know, we weren't really the best um, in condition to play against them, especially since they outplayed us in the first leg. Because I think if we would have won that game and we would also won the first leg, I think no one would have been surprised, right? Because obviously we've had a really, we've got really good, good we've got amazing league form, um, we've been playing really well in the FA Cup, no problem. But it's the fact that we were so thoroughly outplayed in the first leg with some of our best players playing that game. It, it just seemed unlikely, very unlikely that we're going to go away from home, win the game by two goals. That that was it, the crazy thing. I knew we were going to concede. That was one of the things. But if anything, as a United fan, all I wanted was just to, to get the lads to go out and just, you know, be proud of themselves, right? Put a good effort in. I didn't care if they lost on a good night. As long as they put a good effort in and some youngsters got a run out, that's all well and good. But the fact that we went there and won in that fashion is just incredible, man. In fucking incredible. And I think those sort of wins... Um, and uh, I think those sort of wins and trophy wins like the Carlin Cup and the FA Cup, they do they do a lot to kind of galvanize a team and to really kind of lay the groundwork to what's to come in the future. And I think that's a, that's the real inflection point. I think all the other league victories that we had in the league, especially against the lesser sides, haven't done that much. I think overall, because I think by and large we're expected to beat those kind of teams. But I think winning a game like this. And then hopefully going on to maybe winning an FA Cup or coming close to it is going to do something, is going to do a lot of good for the team going forward, regardless of who the manager is. It's going to really lay the groundwork in, in order to ensure that we kind of, you know, get back to winning ways, um, quote unquote. And, you know, it goes without saying, we're probably sure that, you know, Solskjaer is going to get the job. But even if he doesn't get the job, whoever comes in next has got a real good, a, gr- a good bunch of players, proper players who have kind of really proved their worth, um, who've kind of shown their quality. And, you know, and the holes are obvious where they are. You know, we probably need a couple of right backs now. Now that we figured out the lows are, is a right winger, um, we probably need some competition for Luke Shaw. We definitely need a solid world-class centre-back to um, partner with Lindelof and to force some competition between Jones and Smalling. We probably need another midfielder, maybe a winger and maybe a striker, right? So there's still some holes there. 
Um, but by and large, I'm happy that the base of the team is kind of, especially the ones that were, um, especially the ones that were kind of, you know, on the sidelines and were looking at the, on the way out, like the Freds, McTominay's and Pereira's. Like, I'm just more happy for those kind of guys, man. They've actually essentially rescued their career, which is fucking incredible to see um, from the outside. But yeah, that that's something I'm still recovering from. I'm not sure any United fans going to really recover from it. But, you know, sport, football, especially football is just a wonderful game, man. It's just one of those things, isn't it? You, just, you can never... Especially in Champions League, because you know, by and large, most teams in Champions League are are of good high standing, right? Are all high quality teams, so you can never take anyone for granted. Because on the night, they, everyone has players that can hurt you. Um, maybe PSG took us for granted. I don't know, but regardless of what happened, I'm just happy United are through, man. We've got some more European nights to savor. Anyway, um, let's get into the topics because we don't have long today. Oh, we do have long, but you know. It's always, it's always better to say that, right? It's, we don't have long, or we've been inundated with response. Um, we're just, um, thanks for getting back to us, you know, whatever. Like, you know, when you apply for jobs and they tell you that thing and they reply back to you saying, oh, the, 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 the interest has been extreme. What? No, what did they say? The demand has been extraordinary. We've been really impressed with everyone's. It's like, I don't care. Did I get the job or not? Like, did I get an interview? Yeah, or not. It's like, they're telling you these things to make you feel better. It's like, we know it's a fucking cam response. We know it's a copy and paste job. Because I copied and pasted my response to you, my um, <laughs> cover letter to you. So I definitely know you're not fucking there typing away this. Oh, I guess, you know, loved your CV. Loved the bit you said about working on the shop floor. That was amazing, right? No one's saying that. <laughs> <sighs> I love it, man. The fucking circus when it comes to applying for jobs. It just always surprises me. It always makes me laugh. The circus to apply for jobs. The circus at jobs. Um, The first couple of weeks that were, you know, the little bits of small talk. Um, yeah, it's just always funny to me because you're never, you're never really sure who you're talking to, right? You're never really sure if the person you're talking to is the ally or like a snitch, right? So you're not, you're wary, right? And when I mean ally, I mean like, you know, someone that likes to get fucked up as you, someone likes the same things you do, somebody that has the same interest. You're never really sure if they're an ally or if they're a snitch, a person that's going to be like, oh, you know, when you, you're both been out on a stuff night out the night before and then they come in early and then the manager asks them, oh, do you know where so-and-so is? And like, oh, um, when I left, he was still fucked up on the table. Do you know what I mean? Those kind of people who are that unintentionally or, or intentionally snitch and um, do you over, right? Um, the kind of person that makes sure they hand in their project before you hand in yours so that if you hand in yours late, you look worse um, because your colleague did better. So you're never really sure where, how to play it. And then you you kind of get into this fucking loop of these banal conversations that don't really go anywhere, right? Oh, where did you go? Oh, what did you do before? Yeah. No one fucking cares about any of that shit, right? For the most part, because you want to get to the real of it, right? You want to get to the core. But again, you don't know that person, right? You can't start asking personal questions. You can't start asking, hey, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? Um, where's your mum? Do you, do you still speak? Um, is your family near? Um, When's the last time you felt really happy? Do you know what I mean? You can't really go into that kind of shit because you don't know the person, but you really want to because that's where the interesting conversation is going to come from. Instead, you have to kind of do this fucking banal dance. Oh, how you doing? How you had a good week? How's your weekend? It's fucking ugh, so annoying. But again, hey, you got to play the game. It's part of the process, but... Or maybe you don't have to play the game, right? That's what I'm thinking these days. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I don't have to play the game. Maybe I just don't have to do that. Can I just go to work and come home? Is that possible? And not be social? Um especially now like in a place where it's fucking you know it's social olympics like um people are really social uh just tired man i just can't be bothered is that all right again i don't know if it's an old age thing but it's just i just cannot be bothered um and again it's not like an arrogance thing it's not saying oh i have a full life outside of work i don't need any friends it's not that kind of thing at all it's just i can't be bothered but then i'm also very aware right because i'm I've been in a working environment for way too long, more, more longer than I would, than I would um, like to be. And I'm hoping that sooner rather than later, I can fucking break out of this shit. But having been in a working environment for as long, long as I have been, I do know how important, I'm aware of how important those little extracurricular activities are to the um, safety of your job, right? Or to, the, uh, uh, or to the possibility of you passing probation. They're very, very, very important. More important than you'd probably know. Like, super important. Um, they shouldn't be, really, but they are. Like, I've seen people do really poor jobs, but be the social kind of linchpin in the group and pass probation, right? Because, by and large, no one wants to, no one wants awkward convers no one wants awkward conversations that result in someone saying, yo, you got to let go. People just want to, you know, they don't want to deal with it in that way. So, they'd much rather keep someone they like than keep someone they don't like, especially someone they can't hang out with. 
So usually in workplaces, if you're the kind of person that doesn't smoke, doesn't do drugs, doesn't drink alcohol, you're going to really struggle. Like in a group setting, you'll struggle a lot. Um, again, something that shouldn't be happen, it shouldn't happen, but you'll real struggle. The only, the only hope you have is if you can find a group of people inside your work in in your workplace who have the same sort of interests as you, who don't like to go to bars and hang out all the time as other people do in, in workplaces. That's your only hope. If you can't find those people, you are fucked. Um, yeah, especially if you don't want to go out. And I'm kind of starting to maybe feel a little bit of that burn now at the moment. Um, again, I can easily turn it around because you know. I know if I know if I turn up, if man shows up, if I show up at the dance, everyone's being my friend, right? I know that, but um, I just don't want to, man. I don't, again, I don't know what's happening. I just don't want to. I just really don't want to. But again, I'm aware. If I don't, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna bite me in the ass. That's for sure. So yeah, the, 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 those are the things I'm thinking of at the moment. Um, and also I'm flipping waiting for this amazon package to come as well it's so annoying it was meant to come in yesterday you know and you're, again it's the it's the it's first world problems right because amazon prime i don't know let's say out of a hundred out of a hundred times it's probably on time 90 90 90 times out of 100 right that's that's a fact but when it doesn't come on time it's annoying because they do that thing on when you order something they have that counter where it says oh if you order it in the next four hours you can get it the next day I did it, right? It comes the next... It, it doesn't come the next day. I get one order that comes the next day and the other three things which are my books haven't come in. And you know how much I love my books. Huh? You know, you know, you know. Um, and it hasn't come in yet. Uh, and now I don't know if it's... Hand, and it says um, when you're going to track it, it says it's handed to the resident. But I am the resident. Can you see? I'm the resident. Look, look around. This is the house, right? You can even hear me through the microphone. It sounds like a house. House, house, house. Right? <laughs> That's a house, right? Um, but it's not here. It says it handed to residents. What does that mean? Is it handed to the security guard? Was it hand was handed to a, a neighbor who hasn't gave, given it to me? Imagine your neighbor stealing your books. Like it's annoying, isn't it? I always wonder that as well. Like I always wonder if pe- pe- the people that go around stealing people's Amazon packages because people order the most you know generic items from Amazon nowadays, right? People don't really. I don't know. People do people order really high ticket value items from Amazon a lot. I don't know if they do. So imagine the person that's going around snatching packages from people's front doors like you're gonna get some the most randomness of things isn't it you'll get my free books you'll get somebody's iphone usb cable you'll get i don't know someone's vitamin pills right you get the most craziest shit you'd have to luck out and find a fucking iphone or something there right but it's not gonna really happen is it um but yeah i'm hoping that turns up and if it doesn't i'm hoping to get a refund man because man can't be doing this you know you pay eight pound a month whatever it is for amazon prime and you spend to come on time and it doesn't you pay eight pound a month for Amazon Prime. It's meant to come on time, but it doesn't. That kind of rhymes, isn't it? Ugh. Sorry, I feel dirty for saying that. But anyway, let's roll into some topics, some stuff I've seen during the week that I wanted to talk to you, good people, about. So let's move this thing away. Oh, number one, a finesse gone wrong. Finesse gone wrong. This story intrigued me, right? And um, when it first kind of came out a while ago, I think a couple of months ago, no, 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 yeah, a couple of years ago, sorry, so the story goes, right, this is, I'll give you an overview, the story goes that there's this, um, there's a homeless guy on the street, and I think it's in America, right? a homeless guy on the street, a couple passed this homeless dude in the street, um, no, I think, that, sorry, there's a couple driving on the highway, their car breaks down, and they're just in those weird predicaments where they don't have any cash or any money on them, I think their phones died, whatever it may be, so, as it, wherever they crashed on the street, wherever they um, uh, pulled over and the petrol ran out, a homeless dude happens to walk by and he gives them the last $10 he had, or so $10 that he got from begging on the street. They take that $10, they, they put their petrol in their car, and they feel ever indebted to this homeless dude. So this couple, in their, you know, altruistic ways, um, decide to set up a GoFundMe page um, in honor of this homeless dude that gave them the last bit of money that he had um, in order to make sure that they got home safely. Obviously, this GoFundMe goes viral because everyone on social media likes to prove how much of a good person they are by, you know, retweeting and sharing these fucking heart-wrenching stories instead of actually going out and doing um, good works in their community that they live in. But that's a topic for another day. It goes viral. They raise over $150,000 um, and everything goes well, right? That's the end of the story. You're wrong. So it transpired that the whole thing was a fucking lie, right? They all worked in. They all worked together, like the homeless dude and the couple, to try to kind of concoct this whole story. And um, it all it all unraveled only because they went on. It only unraveled because of the media appearances they started to do and the way they started to talk about the story and people started to poke holes in it. Does that remind you of anything else? Jesse Smollett, right? It only st- again. No, Jesse Smollett, not so much, right? Because I guess from the onset. A, a person like myself, I wasn't one to go out and say it in social media, but 
for the very moment I heard the story, I thought it was fake, right? It just sounded too, um, um, it just sounded too made up, right? The MAGA hat, the noose, the bleach. It's like, come on, man. There was just too many things, too many trigger points. Um, so I didn't, I, I knew it was fake from the beginning, but the story really unraveled for Justice Smollett when he went on Good Morning America, right? And he sat down and started talking to people like, mm, that's not something that someone does, right? If they go through a hate crime, right? It doesn't seem the, like the the natural progression of things. Um, again, that's the, that's just my opinion. But it all kind of unraveled once they decided to go into appearance and the whole story is just fucking crazy. And it also, what's crazy about it is that it unraveled when they went on a TV appearance and it also unraveled because the couple got greedy, Right? They didn't actually give the, the homeless dude who actually was homeless his fair share of the money. So from then on, the kind of he kind of obviously snitched and said, hey, where's my money? And the story kind of unraveled from there. Police investigated it. And now they're all facing jail time. So let's read the story. Right? It's fucking fascinating, right? Absolutely fascinating. The depths that people will go to nowadays to finesse. And again, does this, how much of a, how much of a bad person are you? Or can you say evil that you do this? That you'd prey on people's um, um, willingness to show how compassionate and how altruistic and how giving they are and kind of tap into this by doing this kind of scam. How bad of a person are you? And how much other things have you done in your life that also are equally as bad? Because this isn't a one-off thing. You don't just suddenly sit around. Imagine you and your girlfriend or you and your boyfriend sit around in a, in a house one day watching Netflix chilling. Right? And you're maybe, I don't know, you, you, you may be short of a couple of pounds because, you know, it's not payday yet, right? It's the middle of the month. You're both fucking poor. You've fucking made some pieces at home. You're just doing a couple shit. And then you realize, you know what? Instead of thinking about ideas of how you can make money and how your girlfriend might be able to sell cupcakes and you might be able to start that personal training thing that you want to always do, you both sit there and concoct this idea about making a fucking fake, um, uh, a fake go pump, go find me, go find me page in order to get money out of people. That is psycho shit, right? Because usually in a couple, there's usually one person that's the sane one. One person that's a kind of the voice of reason, like, babe, shut the fuck up. What the fuck are you talking about? You're a psycho, right? But no, it seems like they're really in love and they're really a real couple because they both think the same way. Fucked up. Anyway, the story goes, right? This is on BBC News. Uh, Johnny Bobbitt, two, uh, two admit GoFundMe hoax about homeless men. A homeless man and a New Jersey woman have admitted um, concocting a hoax uh feel good story it definitely was feel good story that drew more than four hundred thousand in a gofundme donation now you know what i'm thinking about a hoax right this brings me to an attention of things that i i don't like watching anymore there was a point where i stopped watching american idol britain's got talent x factor all those kind of programs because i started to feel as if like again it, it could be the producer's fault it couldn't be the fault it might not be the fault of the actual people that sing on the program but i got the feeling that whenever the the sub story came around that some people would concoct a sub story in order to kind of elicit some emotion, in order to have that emotion be a driving force into them delivering a really spectacular performance, right? Like that performance where everyone's kind of standing up and oh, <laughs> they're crying and they're clapping, which I don't know how people do, right? I don't know how you can cry and clap at the same time. It's probably like sneezing and singing at the same time, right? It sounds really unlikely people would do it. And it always felt like they was forcing it, right? And it reminded me of a time when I was in school where they made us like... Um, I don't know what do you remember that time when you're in primary school and they do this some thing where they like they ask you to tell a sad story about yourself and people start crying and shit. The kids start crying. I remember being such a fucking psychopath in school, right? <laughs> ah! Oh, it's embarrassed even saying it. I'm crying. I remember being such a psychopath in school that someone was telling some fucking sad story about something. Um, I don't know what it was about their dog dying or something. No, sorry about a family member dying. And I said something about a dog. I don't have a dog, right? African people don't have dogs, right? We don't fucking have dogs. Um, we, we never had a dog. And I remember going up to, to, to talk in front of the school, in front of the classroom, sorry. And I made up some story about my dog dying. Well, I didn't have a dog. They had the ambulance came and they took the dog away. And I don't know, do, do ambulance comes for dogs? I don't know. I have no idea. Right? And I just started crying. Everyone was like crying in the classroom. And I felt really good, right? I felt amazing. That suddenly I was crying about something that didn't happen. And I suddenly had a sympathy of all my classmates. And we all could burn around as like, you know, the people that lost something, right? And there's something to be said about that, right? There's something to be said about that Justice Smollett case, right? You know, the whole victimhood thing. There's something gratifying about this whole climate area now where everyone's a victim. Everyone's have suffered from some kind of oppression. Wherever you, wherever you cut your intersectional lines, right? Somebody is an oppressor and has been oppressed, right? Regardless of your race, color, or creed. So because of that, everyone wants to take part. But hey, I, I have some, something went fucked up in my life too. Can, can I get some sympathy? 
And I felt that at the time, right? And it's a fucking disgusting feeling to think, to feel of it now. To think of it now is, makes me feel, ugh, I feel disgusting and yucky, but it makes sense nowadays, especially where everyone's a victim and everyone is getting a platform to speak and you get a book deal and you get press coverage and you might release a podcast and you might become an activist or some of the people um, have... Uh, someone that people run to, you might get a blue, a blue check on social, which is fucking, you know, um, priceless. There are things that come with it that would obviously make you think, you know what, a lot of these stories out there might be hoaxes. And that's why I think sometimes when I see American Idol and X Factor, it's like, are all these people going through fucked up shit? It's everyone that sings going through some sort of turmoil or some sort of anguish that they have to get on a microphone and sing their heart out? I don't think so. I don't think so. Anyway. Let's continue the story. U.S. military veteran John Johnny Bobbitt uh, pleaded guilty in a court to conspiring to counterfeit money laundering, and Caitlin McClure, twenty-eight, admitted her wire fraud. They claim Bobbitt gave McClure in his last twenty. Um, also, Bobbitt. Oh, that's that's even sadder. So, Bobbitt, the homeless guy, is a fucking is a U.S. veteran. Why are veterans always end up homeless, man? What the fuck is happening here? Um, they claim that Bobbitt gave McClure in his last twenty dollars when he's when he's when, when he when her car ran out of petrol. In Philadelphia, in November two thousand seventeen, uh, more than one fourteen thousand people from across the world donated money. Um, the bogus Good Samaritan story was posted by McClure and her then boyfriend, also not together anymore, Mark D'Amico. Bobby McClure and D'Amico still face additional charges of theft by deception and conspiracy to commit theft. I wonder what GoFundMe are doing on their end because I guess again I wouldn't say it happens a lot, but it must be something they must be analyzing, right? The GoFundMe team, like how they can prevent these cases from happening, how they can maybe investigate it in house because. Uh, come on like but then again yeah, these startups man i get i bet they're all happy clappy and go for me right they'll believe anything that comes around their way um but there has to be a, a department within go for me that can actually sit through campaigns and see if that's this sounds like fucking bullshit right and call it to task or maybe ask the person for more evidence but then again i guess in this world if you could if you call someone's story bullshit and you ask for more evidence they could end they could it um potentially end you right post screenshots oh I did, they didn't believe my story no one believes my pain da, 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 da. believe just listen all this sort of nonsense anyway it continues um da, 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 da. the couple had become acquainted with Bobby about a month before the hoax during their trips to a casino of course people that go to a casino would want to contact this the story melted hearts around the world but began to unravel once the trio began media appearances gushing about the outpouring of online support for bobbit McLaren sent a text message to a friend and launched the story was completely made up of course you do that right you're because you're a dummy I can, oh, people man instead of using the money to help bobbit officials say the couple spent it on a bmw new year's trip, trip to la after uh, las vegas sorry visit disney world and designer handbags well they deserve to get caught then right this is what happens when you're that's what i'm saying if you if you investigate that couple and you dig into their past i bet they've had loads of schemes they've done before that haven't worked out where they try to fuck people over you don't um you don't do a scam right you don't try and you don't concoct a finesse with someone and then when you get the money cut those cut that person out because you're all you're all part of it and that person is owed that money and if they're not going to get the money they're just going to snitch on everyone that's a standard thing right if i can't get the money i'm just going to snitch and that's a really scumbag thing to do right there has to be some honor amongst thieves especially the only three of you is like fuck just give him a bit of the money like what's wrong with these people man so greedy um uh the couple allegedly withdrew eighty five thousand dollars at a casino in las vegas atlantic city and a philadelphia suburb bobby a homeless drug addict later sued the couple saying he did not get his fair share of the donations <sighs> a homeless drug addict ex veteran it's just a fucking only in america man it's amazing and um, he said he only received seventy five thousand dollars only right he, i bet he ran through that in a fucking instant he could an eighteen thousand trailer bought for him and parked at the couple's home now that's fucking taking the piss they bought him a trailer and they parked at their own house yeah we bought your trailers here man use it whenever you want <laughs> use it whenever you want the lawsuit spurred prosecutors to take a closer look led to the criminal court, criminal charges oh okay so i guess the guy suing them because they didn't pay him his equal share kind of threw the officials for a loop like hey what the fuck's going on over there and of course they, when they uncovered it they feel oh. mcclure is facing very three months in prison while bobbit the ex-veteran is flu is facing um custodial term between six to 30 months uh, according to Philadelphia Inquirer, Bobby will learn his sentence later this week from a court which allows addicts to receive rehabilitation rather than criminal sentence. That's fucking awesome. Um, Mark D'Amico is also facing charge of criminal t- trespass after McClure's family accused him of refusing to leave the home they shared uh, after their romantic breakup last. So they obviously everyone broke up. They the couple broke up. The homeless guy didn't get his money or his trailer, 
absolute catastrophe of a situation. But again, that's a that's a horrible finesse, right? Imagine you you're in it together and then you get scammed out of it at the end. Uh, I hope the veteran gets his rehab and he gets the help he gets, but the couple can go can go and get buried under a prison, man. Absolute scumbags. Absolute scumbags. Anyway, next on the list here. The most popular sneaker in the world. Okay, this is my opinion, right? Again, my opinion because I went to Berlin recently and I've been to other few places in a couple other years, uh, such as Barcelona and Madrid and a few other places. But is it me, right? And this has kind of been a, an example because obviously this article I've seen a high piece. But is it me or is the Adidas Continental the most popular shoe uh, in the world right now? Just think about it, right? In terms of the sneakers you see around your city center, wherever you live, right? Um on the train, on the way to go to work, on the, when you're going out, when you're hanging out with your friends, what do you see a lot of people wearing day to day, right? It's not really Yeezys and stuff. You have to go to certain areas to go see that kind of stuff. If I go to Shoreditch, Old Street, Dawson, uh, Peckham, Leighton, um, Leighton uh, sorry, Lewisham, Streatham, Brixton, um, Notting Hill, um, Enfield, Angel, I'm going to see Yeezys, right? The kind of hot, the kind of hipster hotspots. But Away from there, I always see people wearing the Continentals, right? And again, I'm not sure why they're so popular. I'm not sure why they've become more popular than, let's say, Reebok Classics, which they've kind of taken inspirations from, right? Because Reebok Classics, you don't really see people wearing them that often. If you do, it's a particular kind of, you know, um, dirty hipster with white socks and black jeans rolled up, right? It's a particular kind of look. Um, but Continentals, I've seen them worn everywhere. I've seen them worn by Italian tourists. I've seen them worn by um, uh, kids in Berlin, like everyone's wearing these shoes and at the, at the time when i saw them i thought they were like um on sale or something because sometimes you know a place like Foot Locker or jd sports or like even an asos or whatever it may be called would kind of put a huge run of these shoes because these are shoes that they they have to kind of buy season in season out right most shoes um especially if you've got an adidas account they they might allow you to buy some like limited edition shoes but you have to buy some you have to then buy some bits of the line that are just like you know the core kind of collection quote unquote so a lot of these stores would get a huge allocation of these shoes and you know it's impossible to shift all of them right um there's only so many feet in the world that you can adorn so sometimes it'll be like sweeping um slashes on prices on these shoes and because they only retail for i think for about 90 quid anyway when you slash them by like you know 40 percent whatever they become really appealing and plus they're quite easy to wear so wherever i've been out in london overall i've seen these shoes fucking everywhere and i guess Again, it might be able to do, to do a sale and it also might be to do a strategic Adidas move because there's an article now I've seen on the hype piece called, um, and it says the following Adidas now is the most expensive content to release to date, um, which means that I think they're going to put out a lot of these shoes, right? So the article says the following, after emerging in in various one of colorways, ranging from the scarlet red to understated um, grade, the updated... Um, the understated Adidas content was set to arrive in a wide variety of colorways. An up and coming drop will deliver the comfortable silhouette in low less than six distinct makeups. So, six more colorways coming out. The four inch content will hit the global markets on March 14th. So, they've made an entire campaign over these shoes that looked quite core, cool, looked quite generic. So, I think Adidas are obviously seeing on their end of it in terms of sales that these shoes are fucking going everywhere. This is turning into like the Adidas um air force one right in that respect because i've honestly i've seen it everywhere like i've seen it literally everywhere and i've seen it on on a wide range of people too which then goes to show how popular it actually really is and again for me i'm quite a fan of it it's taking inspiration or maybe it's the other way around maybe the calabasas take inspiration from this but i quite like it man i think it's one of those shoes that you can generally wear with most outfits um, it works really well with the gum sole i think there as well and again with my um resistance or hesitancy or refusal to wear anything that's to do with Reebok this is probably the best thing this is probably a good um middle ground if you don't want to wear Reebok classics and look like um you know one of those guys that I don't know listens to R Rinse FM on your phone I think this is probably the best way to do it um Adidas Continental they look really nice here I really like this all red colorway actually red with like the black and yellow stripe on the side and I'm, I wonder how comfortable or uncomfortable they are to wear as well um and looking at them as well they would probably make a quite a good skate shoe right if they were decided to update them a little bit maybe the, maybe the tread needs to get updated somehow maybe you need to change the tread in some way shape or form maybe make it vulcanized if you want but i think it would be a pretty good skate shoe um again oh look at this black is that black suede black new book oh but they're probably women's in it right black new book with like a pink and i don't know if that's a cream swoosh cream um, stripe on the side they look fucking hard they're really nice. Again, um, I'm assuming this kind of run, as per usual, there's a black leather pair as well. This will probably coincide with a collaboration drop, as per usual. Most of these brands will do this. They'll drop a little core collection of these shoes. They obviously 
adorned them on some young looking models with dickies worn here and denim and girls wearing dresses with the shoes so they obviously know what they're doing and who they're aiming it at and i'm assuming in the next few months we'll probably see a collaboration come up with a, from a brand using the content using the the continental silhouette that's something that i can probably um say with some sort of confidence without get, having any sort of any inside info and again i wonder if it is a strategic move from adidas that they purposely flooded the market with these shoes seeded them to a few people and then they won but i don't think so because i think most influencers like wearing wacky shoes isn't it they don't necessarily wear like normal shoes like you know an influencer to me like especially the ones like you know i kind of grew up idolizing like the hiroshi fujiwara's and those kind of likes they wouldn't just wear the wackiest stuff they'd kind of pull stuff from the archives like you know like bruins and stuff like basic shoes and kind of like you know um raise them and put them on a, on a pulpit but hipsters nowadays like wearing really 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 funky shit if it's not funky they ain't they ain't fucking interested which is you know annoying i guess for uh people like myself but you know you gotta do what you gotta do but yeah i like the look of the continental and um, hopefully we see more of these models coming up soon and again don't be surprised if you don't see a collaboration of these coming up very very soon um what's next on the docket here uh, oh it's a good little article right um that i saw actually on high snobiety um who a study finds a study because you know study, people always like studies or oh, do they like studies now they don't really because these studies usually point out the most obvious of things that we all kind of knew but this is an article i found on high snobiety that i thought was of interest it says a study finds artists become more famous because of who they know not their work <laughs> Are you surprised? I'm not surprised, motherfucker. Um, again, let's read a bit of it before we kind of dive on deep and start to my form my own opinion. Um, zoom in here, gets on screen. High snobiety is up on the screen. You can see that, right? Yep, there you go. A new study has found that uh, becoming a successful artist is more about who you know um, than how creative or original your art is, which you know I think we can all kind of agree. Published by Columbia Business School and reported by um, Artsy, the research paper, The Art of Fame Maps the Social Networks of the Early 20th Century. Abstract artists like Pablo Picasso, Paul Klee, um, Wesley Kodinsky, which I studied when I was in school, it found that um, artist um, networks were more likely the reason that they were succeeded professionally. Um, contrary to um, conventional literature, there was no statistical support for a relationship between an artist's creativity and the fame that they ultimately achieved. Um, those individuals who possessed a diverse set of personal friends and personal contracts from different industries, an artist um, in a cosmopolitan network uh, position was physically more likely to become friends. Oh, famous, sorry. The study took this, date, um, this data from the MoMA 2012 exhibition Inventing Abstraction 1910 to 1925 to determine that a made um, what made a work original researchers got machine learning algorithms to rate how unique a piece of works compared to the range of artworks. In the 19th century, the study also had a group of art historians rank networks, artworks, sorry, based on the based, um, based on, based on original, fuck, again, some places, right? You want to write for them, right? and then get this girl's face out of the way i'm not taking piss out of her but you want to write for these places right you send them emails like, okay i can write for you guys i've done write for in the past they're like now nah, we're good and then you see senses like this the study has also had also had a group of art historians rank artworks based on based on originality and innovation like come on man i can do much better than that but anyway that that's neither here and there so this article um i'm you know i think we can all kind of say is fairly obvious um, I can kind of speak from my own personal purview that is very true. Speaking, coming from my DJing side of stuff, like before I was playing regularly in bars and clubs, I was sending emails and texts, no, well, emails mostly and Facebook messages out to any club you can mention, any promoter, any fucking bar manager you can mention under the sun and get absolutely no shine, right? No info, no, um, no kind of answer back, nothing, no interest, nothing, zero zelt, right? I was kind of just shouting into the wind which is fine, you know, everyone's got their own purview, I don't judge it, it's all good and good, you throw out a, resp you throw out a question, it doesn't always, you know, always, um, you should always expect a response, right, you're, you know, kind of disturbing somebody without them ask politely, without them asking you to get in touch, so I can understand cold emails and cold uh, messages can kind of get annoying, but the moment I got one thing is the moment all of the things started to roll into place, because they, it, okay, it became a network, because the moment I started playing in one place, um, a manager that worked in that place then went somewhere else and they put me to that place and then somebody that was drinking in, in the other bar I was playing in then decided to hire me for another thing and then playing in that thing I mean it kind of it it did depend a lot on the people that I was playing in front of more so the, the, than what I was doing right so, like I'm in no um, I'm in no um, 
have have no illusions, right? Like this is something that I'm very very much certain on, right? I'm up, I'm up there with as many like imagine the top tier, the middle tier, wherever they are, the scene DJs. I'm up there with the best of them when it comes to the scene DJs, right? When it comes to top tier guys, Seth Trucks, all those kind of dudes, they're on another stratosphere. When it comes to scene DJs who are doing their thing and touring around the world and playing in places and have their radio shows and stuff, I'm as good as all these people, right? I'm fairly confident of that, and I'm also very sure, fairly sure that if I this if I was if I happen to get an opportunity to play on Boiler Room and happen to play in front of these kind of people, that that would automatically snowball my career and it would inevitably lead me to getting far more opportunities after that, right? And that isn't because of me thinking I'm good. It's more so to do with the people that I'm in front of. And that's something that was fairly evident to me in the beginning of my journey, right? I knew for sure, especially considering the fact that I was unwilling to kind of um, ask people to to play in places like i don't get me wrong the, before i said i i'd contact clubs and bars and stuff to go play there but i was I, I didn't ask any of my promoter friends to play um even though a lot of these people i've had them play in my club nights right i've had them play in my club nights in dawson not one of these people like kind of re- returned a favor per se like none of them even if, even if they thought i was shit right just to just to kind of the exchange the kind of courtesy of like oh you let you let me play at your night a few times i heard you dj come play my night nah never happened right again people are people are dickheads right it's all well and good but again i don't expect anything from anyone so i'm not really judgmental in that regard i don't really have any feelings towards it but what was i saying at that point but i was very aware that i was taking a big risk or i was going to suffer a lot of consequences because i wasn't willing to kind of put myself out there and ask these people hey i am i let you play and kind of call a favor and again i wasn't willing to do it i wanted to go through it the kind of right way by contacting the bars and, and letting them play play that way but of course those people have their own relationships have their own networks that they trust and they don't want to get any new people in and, they, and of course they can't take a chance they can't take a chance that i'm shit and they have to play for an hour in the club and they can't get rid of me right so i just completely understand that but then I think some people, especially on social media way, and especially on comments and stuff with some individuals, they get really annoyed when they see people make it and they feel as if like they're making it only because of the circle of friends that they have, right? The people I think of straight away is Brendan Shaw and the Virgil Abloh. Brendan Shaw in the podcast and Comedy Word and Virgil Abloh are probably good examples. Because people look at them from the outside and just think, oh, you're only there because of the people that you know, which is partially true, right? But they're also there because of how good they are. You have to marry those two things up. I don't think nowadays, especially in social media world, it's basically impossible. Uh, what did you say is impossible? It's kind of impossible to make it just on your own based solely on the work you do. You have to have somebody say, oh, that was awesome. Check this thing out, right? Or do something for somebody and then that person investigate. It doesn't mean it's a gatekeeper thing. It's just a, a, a matter of fact, right? It's just a matter of um, exposure and reference, right? So if I'm a, like that kid that, have you seen that recent thing that went viral of that kid that drew, a, that kid that did a drawing of um, Kevin Hart? Um, he made like an amazing realistic sketch of Kevin Hart, right? Some kid in Africa. That kid's been drawing for a long time, right? He's probably only he's probably only under 10 years old or some shit. He's not super old. But he's been drawing for a while, right? He's been around for a while, drawing loads of uh, sketches and doing loads of portraits. I'm going to be... I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's probably done a lot of other celebrity portraits. That probably isn't his first. But this one suddenly hit. Suddenly, Kevin Hart saw it, liked it, retweeted it, made a comment and said, hey, um, I want to commission you to do more work. And suddenly that kid's um, stuff is all over the social, all over the news outlets. Um, and he's quite, and I'm sure his life's going to change from this moment on. So again, that's an example of like, you just can't go by the work you do. You have to hope that the work you do see is, a, is get seen by the right person or the work, or you work in tandem with the right people. And then by standing next to them, you get exposed. And people are like, oh, who is that guy in the red hat? And then that kind of goes on from there. Um, and again, I just don't know why suddenly on social media, it kind of, especially on social media where that's how it, it basically works, right? Social media works because people have that idea that they want to be associated with certain people, right? That's where, that's part of the reason why you're on this, exposing your work. You're wanting people to see it, share it, all that sort of malarkey. It's just weird how with those two people, especially with Virgil and Brendan Shaw, whenever you see a comment regarding them or something to do with them succeeding or going further in their life, everyone's always saying, oh, they're only there because of Kanye or they're only there because of Joe Rogan. It's like, yeah, we know that, but they've got given the opportunity, right? They've got given the platform and they fucking run with it, right? There's some people that go on Joe Rogan's podcast as a guest and they're completely dog shit right they don't really rise to the occasion and it probably does them more harm than good right um there's people that go on there's people that get the opportunity to kind of work in tandem with virgil and they probably fuck it up right um it happens all the time but i think when you're given the chance and you're good it's not obviously a good it's good it's a good amplifying a good microphone for you to get your voice out and then for then it to you know resonate with the wider public 
and again this pro this topic probably says it more often than not and i guess with contemporary art it's it's neither it's probably even more important than contemporary art especially considering the galleries you need to represent you the people you need to be around the shoulders you need to rub against like it's it's a bait thing like it's just easy to fucking realize it um again i don't know why people don't think it's true or why they get annoyed by it because i think they have this idealistic mindset that people should be only getting forward in life by just the work but nowadays you have to be a you have to be an all-in right you have to be an all-encompassing uh, media empire you have to be able to distribute you have to be able to make the arc you have to be able to distribute it market it like you have to do all that stuff and if you can just stand next to the right people and do great work by holding it up and stuff like you're gonna fucking smash it um that's basically the point of it right um again number one make sure you're actually good so when you get given the opportunity it comes your way you can fucking go and hit it out of the park that's what i'd say anyway again only in my opinion I'd, what do i know um talking about that 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 there it might be a good chance to talk about actually this um pretty good and pretty lengthy uh virgil um article that was on gq right let me see if i can find it now gq boom 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 so um again i'm not sure what's happening if like um if virgil's having something or maybe it's a tie-in with the exhibition at moma i don't know exhibition at chicago gallery right contemporary gallery is happening he's doing a whole retrospective i'm not sure if it's tie-in with that but it seems like he's getting more and more media attention it's fucking ramping up day in day out i'm not sure what the deal is in that regard but anyway um this matt this huge article came out about virgil on gq star magazine i think he's a he's a cover star in it too it kind of you know maybe was post the off-white show which wasn't my favorite but in general it kind of charts the history of virgil through this perspective of his various friends through his kind of you know inception from his career onwards right and again it's a familiar story we've all heard like in, it's not there's no 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 real new information apart from some anecdotes of his youth and stuff whatever there's obviously a really nice picture here i'm assuming this might be the louis vuitton studio the off-white studio it's fucking gorgeous actually that's one thing you realize when you go to paris paris is fucking beautiful right it's so gorgeous to the eye um you really forget how um aesthetically pleasing it is to hang around in paris and knowing the art and literature and cultural history of it it's just vibrant it's just fucking pouring through the streets right sitting outside a cafe and sipping your your, your mocha your coffee whatever it may be called and pretend to smoke a cigarette like i did during fashion week you feel fucking awesome right it, feel, it gives you so much vitality you feel so alive i was sketching i was writing stuff like paris is one of the most amazing cities anyway um there aside of it being super expensive i think just in terms of energy alone and i can only imagine what it must feel like week in week out working there in your atelier in your studio um collaborating with your friends running around fashion week it must feel fucking cool but anyway this again doesn't there's no real in, new information for those of you that are familiar with the virgil Abel story but going on rolling onto the back of the um the thing we were just talking about from the 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 report the study that found that you know your network mattered more than your actual group of friends this story really charts it and shows it in plain sight because doesn't it? it goes through exactly who the people are the instrument in his life and everyone is somebody of some sort of prominence is some sort of somebody that um is um, an expert or a four or like a lead a, a kind of fourth a thought leader within their little niche so it seems like he's on purpose he's gone out of his way to surround himself with people who are you know inspiring and motivating and have their own sort of thing going on in the side of their space and what also he's done he's not only leached off for of people he's also then when he's got in position he's also brought other people in position too and allowed them to then go and do cool things from photography from photographers to models to um consultants whatever it may be called he's kind of gone in he's kind of been the whole you know the name drop of the dj khaled whatever you might be called of streetwear and kind of gone in and got all these people to come around him and help then he's also gone in and when he's got in position, he's done the same for other people. That's the kind of, you know, the trickle on effect that he's kind of done, which is then goes to, it, go, it says a lot about explaining the, because again, you can judge his work for whatever you want to judge it as, but the amount of real genuine love and appreciation and kind of real friendship that comes, because people actually travel to go to his virtual shows, right? People don't always get invited there. People actually go on their own volition to go and hang out with Virgil, say hi, touch base, do the whole cultural uh, smooching thing because they really like him as a person, right? That goes to show just how valuable and how long and how far that thing can take you. Um, I think nowadays, especially in industry where we're in, where people can be cynical, they can, you know, they can have a chip on their shoulder. They can sometimes feel as if like, you know, because it was hard for them to get in because the gatekeepers were fucking annoying and they were, um, you know, they closed many doors on them that suddenly when they get in position, they're going to do even worse to other people coming up, right? It can it can be easy to think that way. But I think sometimes, it, I think so in life, especially nowadays with, you know, the rise in social media and the direct-to-consumer platforms that we have, I think it's, it's, it's within our best interest, right? 
people from the street where in fashion if we want to see this kind of industry flourish and really rise and really go to the next step it's been an interest to you know to provide a platform for these people to come whoever newcomers whoever they may be and give them opportunities to not hold them back to not close the door on them to open the gates and really let everyone through because what we've seen with the Virgil thing, he might not be the best designer we have on the market. He might not be whatever you maybe think of him. But I think what we've seen is a real shift, right? A real cultural shift happen, right? In terms of who gets these big jobs, in terms of who becomes the person that everyone goes to, right? In terms of if they want something that's going to be culturally on point, that's going to really resonate with people. That Nike 10 collaboration is probably going to go down in real history, right? Regardless of what you may think of it, right? It's going to go down in history of somebody that was able to do a collection of that immense range, right? all at once 10 shoes drop them and they all sell out that's fucking insane um and obviously and of course like the other day i saw this uh, this middle-aged white dude wearing the wearing the white jordan ones right the off-white jordan ones with like a gray um checkered suit with a massive scarf over like just white shoes on um, white trainers with the suit i was thinking fuck that looks fresh and that goes to show just how how far that shoe resonated, those collect that collection. It wasn't only worn by, you know, those Muppets that you see on complex mag complex videos, right? That stand outside Supreme and have, you know, they're decked head to toe with every sort of every single logo under the sun. It's worn by everyday people that just want to wear like a cool little item that has a little bit of a um creative, artistic, cultural, um, you know, element to it that they can kind of slip in there without being too showy showy, right? Because if you wear a pair of what the dunks with a suit, everyone's gonna make you know your adult hype piece. But you wear a pair of off white Jordans with a suit, people are gonna think, oh okay, who are you? What do you do? Do you know Virgil? Are you part of the crew? All that sort of stuff. There's a very there's a very nuanced thing and that's something that you can't buy. And obviously it's something that he's able to do. But the point I'm saying is that if we let everyone in and if we're kind of um allowing the conversation to change, right? And if we're allowing people to come in and if we're allowing um um the kind of gatekeepers to kind of do away and kind of you know stay on the sidelines let people come in and let them prove their worth if they're shit they're gonna die out anyway it doesn't matter right that the next person that comes after Virgil is gonna be the one the next person that comes after that person is gonna be the one like it's it's just it, again I'm just thinking of the I'm just thinking because again I was obsessed with Hiroshi Fujiwara I was obsessed with finding out what Fraser Cook does I was obsessed with finding out the people that are behind Give Me Five I was obsessed with finding out um um nigo um nigo's inspiration and buying fucking vintage um a bathing eight books i was obsessed with tetsu at or w test i was obsessed with this culture and finding out who these old these cultural architects were um aaron bondro's impact right i was obsessed with all these people and i just think of it from the perspective of a 16 year old nowadays right if you're a 16 year old kid now wherever you are in the world and you're seeing someone like Virgil leading, um, being the figurehead of uh, Louis Vuitton men's and having his own brand in Off-White and doing parties all around the world and DJing and doing collaboration with Ikea and Evian Water. Like, what the fuck must be going through your head? It must be an amazing time. Again, because I came up during a time where people were idolizing and wanting to really be, and wanting to be in wanting to be part of the whole um nike collab nike team right they wanted to be part of the nike energy energy marketing team that was the most coveted job on the scene right coveted job i say right no one was really um figuring out a way to become the next supreme people were really limited right like nah man you can't do that no one wanted to be the next bathing ape like oh you can't do that right no one wanted to be the the creative director of, of christian dior no you can't do that but nowadays, this generation, they really think they can do that. They really think they could go in and be the, I don't know, the, the fashion director at, at Lamar, like for real. Like they really do think that because they've got evidence of it, right? Pharrell's got a collaboration um, ongoing with Chanel. Like it's just this crazy world we live in nowadays. Heron Preston's got a complete runway collection, ready to wear collection that he does on the runway in Paris, right? He's backed by a massive uh, group, the New Guards group, right? In terms of production and <laughs> manufacturing. Somebody who I know personally and knew from the time that I knew him from wasn't necessarily a fashion kid right someone that's more of a an artist more of a cultural communicator suddenly translate that image um that kind of aesthetic and that taste level and, and and kind of channeled it into fashion and look how successful that's been it must be amazing being a kid nowadays you must honestly think there is literally no limitation to what you can do in this industry in the scene in this industry and i just think it's up to us of the older statements in the industry to not get too cynical, to not get too bitter. And because we haven't been, we haven't got to where we wanted to get to, to think, oh, we're going to shut the kids out. No, give them all the information you can give because the next person after the ones that are leading the head, leading the kind of race now, they're going to be the ones. They're going to be the ones. I, I, I haven't, I haven't have no doubt of it. The next, the next Virgil is going to be fucking amazing. 
Like, imagine what Kanye is doing nowadays. Imagine what kids seeing what Kanye is doing and what they're going to do next. It's going to be fucking insane. It's going to be absolutely insane. And I can't wait to see the next of it. And again, I just think going on from the network, reading this whole Virgil article on GQ and seeing just how, you know, how highly, how highly some of his mates rate him, uh, the stories from his days in architecture, from the times he was doing streetwear with the Pyrex and off-white stuff, the story of the legendary picture of them outside Fashion Week when they went and gate crashed the Fashion Week. Again, lesson to be learned from that as well from kids, you know. Don't always wait for an invite. Um, actually go to the places because again I, I see a lot of kids doing this nowadays on Instagram or social like contacting these people and reaching out to them and asking them to be interns and stuff through direct message don't do that like everyone does that that's a fool's errand right you can easy to kind of sit at home and just type stuff make something right if you hear someone's doing something they've got collaboration coming up make them a deck um, I don't know send them a t-shirt um, I don't know um, go to a fashion week and bump into them in real life at a party and exchange some conversation uh, talk to them in real life like really get to know people or just be around as well don't talk to people i was um i'm a big proponent of just not saying anything when i was in the scene in the beginning i didn't say jack shit i had a blog that was kind of quite popular at the time but i didn't say anything i just i just stayed in my own little zone and i just soaked up the environment i just soaked up all the game that was around me i just soaked it all up i was just made, uh, mostly a, a perspect uh, uh a spectator and then once i thought i had something to say i then started participating in it but it's not always advantageous to kind of go out and automatically ask for something and kind of draw and kind of extract value. Try and give some value. Just try and be someone that is cool to hang out with, which again is hard to, it's hard to find. If you go, if you kind of read between the lines of um, that Meek Mill tweet that he made uh, post the Rock Nation brunch about um, the, like, you know, SMH, about the things that he saw people were willing to do in order to kind of get that Jay-Z picture, right? Because Jay-Z and Beyonce were there. And of course, everyone was fucking trying to flick up a picture with Jay-Z. So it was like, oh, he, he saw people like lose it all to get that Jay-Z picture, right? Which, are, which uh, leads you to believe that, you know, people kind of embarrass themselves in that situation. People do it a lot more often than you think, right? In those kind of situations when they're in amongst these people that they idolize, the people that have the star factor or they want to get a bit of the rub on them. Get, sorry, they want to get a bit of the rub on that people. People can be a bit weird to hang out with. They can be a bit, I don't know, just annoying, right? Laugh at every joke um get overly involved ask too many questions like just just shitty company sometimes just being cool and just hanging around is going to get you a long way um again so this story kind of really kind of digs in deep with it it's a really good oral history again i'm not too sure what this is tying into if there's a bigger play at, at hand or if this is just a precursor to virgil's um retrospective um exhibition that's coming up very, fairly soon i think but i highly recommend you check it out especially for the kids that are really um interested in trying to get into the industry i think by and large, the best way you can do these things, especially for me, having idolized people like Hiroshi Fujiwara, Aaron Bondaroff, Nigo at Baby Nape, is what you, or James J.B. at Supreme, the best thing you can do is read interviews. Read as many interviews as you can with these people. They're not, they're not hard to find. Go on Google, type in their name, interview, soak up as much information as you can, and essentially just copy what they did. Copy the path they did, not copy the work, copy the path. So if you hear somebody reach out to somebody when they were 18 and try to get an internship, try and do that. If somebody started printing off 30 t-shirts and gave them to friends and then that's how they got started do that if somebody started a zine do that if somebody started djing do that whatever it is start doing those things just work through them and then suddenly throughout the working through those things you'll find your path because sometimes a lot of people ask oh what do you what do i do i want to get involved i want to start this i want to start that i can't tell you what to do it's really hard to me to tell you what to do in a situation because it's a very personal journey right it's not something that anyone can tell you how to do you have to kind of go through it yourself but it doesn't it sounds like someone's fobbing you off when they say that but it's a real truth like i can't tell you how you're going to navigate yourself through the industry you can have to figure out what else you get in there and again, the best way you can do it is by reading these interviews. And this article from GQ, again, you see the whole anthology. Do you remember how much um, controversy or how much stick Virgil got for this flannel? I don't think it's something he would do again because I think a lot of the reason why people hate Virgil, against in my opinion, comes from that flannel. I think if he didn't do that flannel and he just kind of made that, and imagine you take, take that flannel out, even though, or let's, let's price the flannel at the price it probably should be, right? Not $400. Um, and, and this is pre vetemar too, right? This is pre vetemar era of things. The Vetemar, you know, at least with Demna, he came from the school of uh, Martin Margiela. He, he redesigned the hoodie. So essentially, he kind of changed the silhouette of a hoodie for the most part. Um, but Virgil tried to sell us a, a rugby flannel with Pirates written on the back for $500. And we weren't having it. And again, he's, from, all, from, from what it seems like, I don't know if people are just doing it because he's important, he's the main guy. He seems like a good person. People actually like Virgil as a person, right? So I assume most of the reason why people hate him was because of that, was because of that, that shirt. And I wonder if he'd do it again nowadays. I wonder. Probably not. But again, I, I digress. 
read through it. This again, this is a a, a visual history of his entire catalog and what he done and how he got into the industry. And again, look, look at the contrast between that right, that that Pyrex Vision line leading essentially to that off white collection. I think that might be the is that a debut collection that I saw in Paris. That might be, isn't it, with the yellow? Yeah, that might be it. Actually, that might be it. The the yellow, the one that I saw where um Ian Connor went and jumped on Virgil's back, or no, or they ran out together during the runway. But anyway, I recommend you check it out. It's a really good um article. Um, loads of really interesting people that kind of lend their voice to the whole Virgil story, and again, loads of people that kind of feel invested in the fact that he's winning as well. That's another big thing. So again, like I say. You can't always depend on your talent. You also have to marry your talent with the people that you surround yourself with. And, you know, it's within your interest to kind of go out there, put yourself out there and kind of absorb game and, you know, touch base with people and just generally be someone cool to hang over someone that people say, oh, yeah, you do that thing. I find it very difficult to do whenever someone brings up the, the DJing thing or the art thing or the writing thing. I don't necessarily say anything. Right? I don't necessarily go out there and tell people that I do these things. I just hope that they kind of, you know, realize over time, which again is I'm not really taking my own advice, but I can't necessarily do that thing. It's not very good. I'm not very good at self-promotion in real life. Uh, maybe on the internet I am, but not in real life. But I guess if you are that person, you don't have as much social shame as I do. I think it's within your interest, especially if you want to make it in industry because there's so many opportunities out there. There's so much, um, you know, money to get there's so many opportunities so many chances for you to kind of really get your art out there to the biggest group of people i think really urge yourself to try your best to get out there get in public go to art gallery openings go to store openings um wherever they may be all these cultural events freeze whatever especially if i was a kid nowadays i always say it. if i was a kid nowadays i'd i'd um i'd work retail and i'll just save up a bunch of money fuck the festivals right unless there are a couple of key ones that i know some seen people go to and i save all my money and i do like a, an influencer tour an influencer event kickoff like freeze um i go to moma i go to I, I go to new york art book fair i'd try and go to some fashion week attend it and just be around the mix and be around and see if i can go to an after party i'd try to go to paris fashion week especially for men's i do all these things but just save us some money and just go for the weekend and just hang out that probably the best way for you to kind of get forward, I think, in, in a, especially in not just relying on your talent. That's probably not the best way to do it. Again, only IMO. Anyway, that's an hour of me blabbering on. Thanks so much for tuning in to X News Show episode number 168. As per usual, this show is brought to you by Audible. The link for you to click is below. You can get um you can get one free book credit and a 30-day free trial. So uh, if you visit audible.com for slash Aggie, that's audible.com for slash A. G G Y. All information regarding myself can be found at xnozinga.com. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, give me a like, give me a subscribe, share with your friends. If you're on the podcast app, leave me a five star review. Um, let your friends know and all that malarkey. And I'm going to probably see you guys again next week. I've got a busy week ahead of me, weekend ahead of me with the DJing stuff. I'll probably see you guys next week. So in, if you if you're around and you're doing stuff and whatever you're doing the weekend, take care, look after yourself. And I'll see you guys again next week for another episode of the Exxon Zinger Show. Peace.